Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another episode of the show and I've got Frank Stearns here from Ariel, did I pronounce it right? Ariel right. Vineyards? Okay. Ariel. Ariel Vineyards uh, out in uh, California in St. Helena. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and uh, so we're going to go through and uh, we'll do a quick interview, do a tasting of the wine. Um, what I'm really, what, what I'm really kind of excited about with this is the whole uh, kind of geekiness of this. Uh, I think it's a great fit for Leet Wine, for 1337 Wine, um, with the whole Fibonacci and all that kind of stuff. So um, we're going to go ahead and get into it. Uh, Frank, why don't you uh, give me a little uh, history of, of the vineyard and yourself and, and, how we, and how everything came about. Sure. Well, first of all, I grew up in Southern California, but my background is actually in the audio-video business. I, I've been in sound and music um, all of my life and uh, early on in my career I think it was probably 1986 I took one of my bigger customers up to the French Laundry for dinner and absolutely fell in love with the wine country and I, I've been going back three or four times a year and studying wine and winemaking and and the valley and said you know one of these days I'm gonna parlay my success into my own wine brand and so um, about five years ago, uh, the company I worked for, we sold it. I did pretty well on the sale. And, and I invested in REL uh, with the mission to make the best wine I possibly could. And, and my favorite wines were Napa Valley Mountain Cabernets. So I wanted to make a really limited production, best of the best Napa Cabernet. And I wasn't really looking to, to have this be a hugely profitable venture, um, but I wanted to make a statement about what a great mountain Cabernet could be. Okay. So the name Ariel is, is a name that I made up around the Latin roots for sound, A-U or A-U-R, Arl, and the Latin root for gold uh, is also AU. Now in the sound business, guys that are, are known to have good ears are called golden ears. And of course California is the golden state and I've always been a fan of the concept called the golden ratio which is, uh, you said Fibonacci series. So uh, an Italian mathematician way back when in the Renaissance uh, did a study and this is a, a true story what would happen if you just let rabbits breed on their own? And what he came up with is you have one, then you have two, then you have three, then you have two plus three, you have five, and pretty soon you have this sequence. Well, it turns out this sequence is kind of a magic sequence in nature. It describes what's known as the rule of thirds. Um, so if you look at classical compositions uh, like Da Vinci's Last Supper, and you say, what is it about it that's so beautiful? It turns out to be a mathematical formula of two-thirds to one-third, which is the Fibonacci series, three to two, five to, to three, etc. cetera. And, and when you also go a little bit deeper into art and architecture and things like a nautilus seashell, you find out that the ratios between the spiral bands of a nautilus are also in the Fibonacci series or the golden ratio. So I just thought it was interesting how all this stuff kind of came together in, in things that I enjoyed, wine, photography, music. It turns out the best place to put a pair of speakers in a room to have them sound the best is a third of the way in, also rule of thirds, okay. golden okay. state, a golden ear. Um, so that's why I came up with REL and it all kind of fit together for me. And um, to, to me, it represents the blending of art and science. 
to make wine, you obviously need to understand the science of fermentation. To make great wine, you need to apply art on top of the science. So, you know, Da Vinci, Fibonacci, all these things are based, you know, one part math, two parts art. And, and that's where the blending of art and science comes in. That's where Ariel comes from. And that was my mission. All right, very cool. I'm going to do something real quick here. I, I don't see myself, so I'm going to, I'm going to do a little th stop video, um, and then it's just restart. So it should, nothing should change. You might have not seen me for a second there. Uh, do you actually see me in all this? I, I, I see you. Okay, yeah. then I, I'm just going to leave it at that because that's the least important of everything. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, so yeah, the whole the whole art and science with uh, with all that. Um, how did you How did you come up with where you with with the actual um, uh, uh, sourcing of the grapes? Because I see you're using Howell uh, Mountain and Mount Veeder. Well, you know, I've known from going and tasting in Napa three or four times a year for 25 years what I liked. Um, and I was, I was very clear um, after, just I learned, I learned Napa so well that I could consistently tell what I liked, what I didn't like, and where it was from. And, and I found out that I really liked Mountain Cabernets. Okay. I, you know, I also found out that I liked a certain uh, depth, a certain top note, um, you know, and that's from years of tasting and, and experience and just going around talking to people. So when I s decided to do this project, I knew what I wanted to create. I didn't quite know how I was going to create it. So I started to talk to people, people whose wines I liked, people whose styles embodied the style I wanted to pursue. And I heard some things come up consistently. I knew Howell Mountain because my own collection was full of Howell Mountain. I knew Mount Veeder as well. But one name came up in terms of a winemaker, which is a guy named Chad Alexander. Relatively young guy, uh, was the head winemaker at Robert Craig. And um, I found Chad through, through another winemaker that was using Chad as a consulting winemaker, another wine brand. And um, I liked the stuff that Chad had done, and I called him, and I said, listen, this is my vision, this is my project, are you interested in working with me? And he said, tell me more about it. And I, I told him my story. I said, I want to make the best of the best. Um, you know, I'm not looking to make a ton of wine. I'm not looking to make a fortune. I just want to make a statement and make something that I'm really proud of. And how would you go about it, Chad? And Chad, in turn, introduced me to growers on Howell Mountain and growers on Mount Beater. And together we walked the vineyards. Um, I'd studied winemaking at Davis, so I knew a little bit, and I knew enough to know um, that Chad and I were on the same page. And so what we did is put together contracts with very small growers that um, were geeky about wine growing um, and shared my vision and, and understood my mission. And we put together contracts that were slightly different than what you'd normally have. Well, what we said is, we want to make the best possible wine we can, and this is the kind of wine we want to make, so we want this part of your vineyard, this acre, and, and we want to control the yields, we want to farm it the way we want to farm it, we want to, we'll tell you when it's time to pick, um, and then we'll pay you top dollar for what comes off of it, and the yields are going to be small, um, typically under two tons an acre. Okay. Um, so, so very small yields and vines that definitely had to struggle because what we wanted was that mountain intense Napa cap. So uh, on top of that, Chad and I discussed a number of, of winemaking programs and together Chad and I blind tasted and tasted a number of well-known brands that I knew I liked, things that he'd made, things that he'd like. And we, um, we spent a lot of time together tasting, making notes, um, saying things like, you know, really like the cassis in this one, not so crazy about the finish, uh, really like the, the caramel top note on this one. Um, and by the time we'd gotten through that, we had a number of, of prototype wines that we respected. 
Uh, we had a, identified a target style of wine we wanted to make. And then we started talking to uh, coopers. Uh, for example, I really wanted a wine that had a very long finish with lots of layers. Um, some tobacco, some cedar, some stone fruit, but a kind of caramel butterscotch note on the finish. And what I found out is there's a particular forest in France and a particular barrel that's made from that forest in France that will impart that caramel butterscotch taste. So 20% of the barrels we used, and, and they were all French, 80% of them knew, but 20% were from this particular forest that would impart the butterscotch caramel top note that I was looking for. Okay. So we did a lot of homework and a lot of research and um, decided on a recipe together. Um, now, I'm not a winemaker by training, but I'm a wine drinker, and, and I'm pretty good at directing, whether it be a speaker engineer or, or, or a winemaker, into what it is that I want. So, um, you know, then we went out. We got, we got really lucky in 07 in that we didn't get really lucky, but 07 was just a wonderful year to make wine. So on top of the fact that we knew what we wanted and we knew how to get there, we had nature cooperate. That's good. Nice. So nice. it was great. Um, talk about uh, talk about a little bit with um, Hal Mountain and Mount Veter about uh, about the elevation. Uh, what does that give you versus being down in the valley? Well, uh, it's similar on Hal Mountain and Mount Veter in that both in both cases the vineyard sites are up relatively high, um, about twenty two hundred feet. And what that does is um, it's cooler up there, right? Um, but also above the fog line. So in the valley, you get fog that tends to cool down the grapes, and then you get sun. Uh, but if you get a heat spike, you get a buildup of sugar and a decrease in acid, and the fog kind of balances out. Up on the mountains, you get less fog, but you get less heat. So you get a longer, more cool growing season, um, a little bit more like Bordeaux, and you tend to get more acid, uh, but the longer growing season makes up uh, by letting the sugars develop more slowly. So, um, you know, what you get is kind of the best of both worlds. You get good sugars uh, from a long growing season with lots of sunlight, but you don't lose the acid that the heat would cause on the valley floor. So um, on top of that, the soils on both uh, Mount Beater and Hollow Mountain are volcanic. The grapes struggle, so you get much less yield uh, on the mountains than you do on the valley floor. So typically, you get maybe two tons an acre, maybe less, up in the mountains where you'd get three or four in the, in the valley floor. What that means is the grapevines, as they struggle, have to put their energy into less grapes. So having less grapes to support means more intensity of flavors in the ones that develop. So you get longer season, you get um, sugars that develop more slowly, acids that, that stay up and don't get decreased by the, by the sunlight, and then you get um, small berries with good skin to juice ratio and, and you get the, the, the low yields that concentrate the flavors, and that's what makes the Napa uh, mountain cabs so dense and chewy and vibrant and flavorful, and that's always been my favorite, so that's, that's where we went. Exactly. I mean, you know, you're, it sounds like you know, you're, you're, making, you're trying to make the best wine you can, but you're also making something that you like, you know, and you know, it seems like that's one of the ultimate goals of something that, that you you're making something as much as for yourself as for other people. Yeah, I mean, not that, that I intend to, to drink it myself, but I like to, I want to share it with people. Right. And be able to explain to them why it is that I've been attracted to Napa Mountain Cabs for 25 years, what I find in them, why they're different, how they're different, uh, what causes the conditions in which the grapes to be grown um, to be different. You know, again, it's the art and science thing where you can grow a grape um, and make perfectly good wine out of it, but growing a grape in the right conditions, in the right place, with the right terroir, and then making wine with a certain style um, is where the art comes in. 
Um, and again, back to REL blending of art and science. So that and that was that was our mission. Very cool. Very cool. Um, now this is uh, it, it's basically a, it's 100% cab or it's like like 99, 98% cab. Uh, the 2007 that we're going to taste was 97 and a half percent cab. Okay. And that cab part was split 50-50 between Mount Veter grown fruit and Hallow Mountain grown fruit. And then the other two and a half percent, uh, one percent is Petit Verdot. One percent is some Mountain Merlot that was grown in the same vineyard as the, as the Mount Veter cab. Okay. And then um, half a percent was Cabernet Franc just to give a kind of um, more for the nose than for anything else because it's got a distinctive aroma that, that provides a, just another layer. Uh, Petit Verdot is great for color and density and the Merlot kind of provides a mid palette that's, that's interesting uh, where you get fruit on the front then it goes through a layer of, of softness then a long lingering finish uh, and again you know the wines that that I'd like and the wines that I wanted to make all had a very long finish that goes through a number of different layers and flavors as as it kind of decreases so that was that was a goal of the wine making very cool all right um, let's go ahead and get into the wine uh, cuz I'm really excited about trying this out and uh, we're going to get a close up of the label real quick for people to see and um, uh, now, availability for the wine, is it uh, through the website? Do you have uh, distribution throughout the states, or is it only in certain states? Uh, I believe there's 28 states. Okay. Um, through the website and through the mailing list. It's arielvineyards.com, which is spelled A-U-R-I-E-L-L-E -L -L -E, vineyards, plural, dot com. All right. Um, there'll be a link underneath the video, so if you're watching this off the website, stop by the website and you'll be able to click a link to, the, to get to, to uh, Ariel Vineyards. Uh, we make roughly 300 cases a year, so very small production, uh, and sell it through the mailing list primarily. A couple of restaurants here and there, but, but almost all goes to mailing list customers. Okay. All right. Very cool. Well, let's go ahead and get into the wine real quick. Uh, let me tell you a bit about the winemaking because that's that's kind of okay. unique. Okay, so first of all, um, we follow the science that says when grapes should be picked, but then we kind of discount that, and we actually go and we taste the grapes, and we look for um, maturity of the flavor compounds in the grapes before we decide to pick. So we look for things like the seeds inside turning brown and crunchy, which is a sign that they're really, really ripe. Okay. We, we look for the flavor development in the grapes as opposed to just looking at the percent of sugar in the grape juice. And it's important. Um, but it's, it's, it's about the sugar and about the flavor. So if the sugar's there and the flavors aren't, we let it hang. So in the case of this 07, we picked Mount Veter on October 6th, and Howell Mountain wasn't ready for another um, five days. So that was picked on October 11th. We picked it really early in the morning, so the coolest possible point of the day. We brought it down to the winery, uh, crushed it, and then chilled it uh, to 55 degrees and let it sit for three weeks, uh, called extended maceration. So, so kind of sitting and soaking in cold juice so it wouldn't start to ferment but that we would get the maximum extraction out of the skins um, and get the maximum color and more importantly a certain amount of, of soft mouthfeel that makes the, the wine not only extracted and, and flavorful uh, but also makes it approachable uh, so that it's it's soft and silky in the way that it feels in your mouth even though it's it's big um, so we let it sit for three weeks then we used natural yeast and let it ferment we kept the temperature uh, below 87 degrees so it didn't get um, strident or overly um, harsh and once it was done fermenting uh, we of course pressed it off and put it into barrels for aging 
and aged it in 80% new French oak. Used four different coopers, including the ones I described, to get the caramel and butterscotch overtones, and let it um, let it age in the oak for about 22 months uh, okay. before okay. we bottled, and then a year in the bottle before we released it. So um, back to the wine. One thing that, that you need to know is that we didn't uh, fine it or filter it. So you'll probably find some sediment even in a 2007. Okay. Um, because we believe that filtration robs a lot of the subtle flavors. Um, so we tried not to overly rack. We didn't fine, we didn't filter. Uh, we'd rather have a little bit of sediment uh, settle on the bottom of the glass or the barrel and get all the flavor then have the wine be um, sterile. Okay. Um, so, a couple things. The color you'll notice is very deep, very dark, very rich. Yes. Yes. Um, reddish, purple, um, dense, very much a mountain cab. It's not a, a light style. Um, when you swirl it and smell it, you're going to pick up certain things that are very much consistent with mountain cabs, especially uh, how, which is uh, some, a lot of stone fruit, plum, cassis, uh, blueberry, boysenberry, cedar, tobacco, uh, white pepper, a little bit of uh, what I call apple pie spice. I'm not sure exactly what they put in apple pie, but, but I know <laughs> it when I smell it. Um, and you'll, you'll get a lot of different layers. You know, that white pepper really kind of jumps out at me. You should get a, a bit of cedar. Yeah. Tobacco. Boysenberry. Uh, cassis. Plum. Yeah, for me, it's uh, I get it's more more of a um, minerality versus um, fruit nose, but the fruit is there. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm getting a little bit of that like caramel butterscotch too. Yeah, you should get the caramel butterscotch. Took a big whiff, and I got that. Oh man, there's so much going on in this. There's a, a lot going on. What, what you'll notice at first is a lot of um, stone fruit, plum, cream de cassis. Um, then you'll get a little bit of blueberry, uh, which is uh, from the Beter vineyard. Then it kind of changes and gets into uh, cedar, tobacco, leather uh, notes. Then you get a, a bit of the top note of the caramel and butterscotch, and it evolves into a really long finish where you get blueberry caramel, creme brulee kind of thing uh, as, it, as it fades. So I'd say there are probably three or four distinct layers that it goes through, starting with fruit, going through earth, and then almost to dessert. Now, it, it's not sweet. Um, no. But you, but you can taste the fruit in it, you know, and yeah. that's, that's one of the things I do like about, about wines is they don't have to have sweetness, but if you can taste the fruit, you, you can taste that type of, you don't, you don't, you're not getting that sugar sweet, right. but you're getting that flavor. Um, mm. And even, even now the nose is uh, definitely evolving. I'm getting more fruit versus the, the minerality with the spices. Um, and I'm getting kind of that pie aspect. Yeah. One of the things I really liked about the 07 was in kind of the middle of, of the tasting, you get a, a quick shot of blueberry. Um, and it's backed up with really nice acid. 07 was just a fantastic year where things ripened nice and slowly. So you've got all these fruits 
and you didn't lose the acid, so it's it was well framed uh, with some tartness. So while the first tastes are stone fruits, plums and and cassis, all of a sudden you get this burst of blueberry, which is just really cool, and then that fades to to leather and and tobacco, and then caramel. So like I said, it goes through a number of, of different layers. Um, one of the other things I've found is that the wine absolutely benefits from exposure to air um, because again 07 has, is so big and there's so much going on right. that uh, after uh, an hour or two hours of exposure to air things tend to soften up and become even more layered um, which is a concept in wine that, that I really fancy it's also a concept in good speakers uh, that I really fancy, which is being able to hear every uh, every instrument in the orchestra in its place on the stage. Right. Great wines the same way, being able to pick out all the different flavors that it, in their place on the stage uh, as it goes through its its opening and as it gets exposed to air and as as you taste it and through the finish. Um, so, like you said, there's a ton going on here. You know, and and I like your your music reference. I mean, that, that's actually my degree. Was music and, and having that um, when you when you hear music mixed in a way where you can hear the individual instruments, um, but they're not the the instruments that need to be in the forefront are, and the instruments that need to be in the background are. But I'm still able to if I want to listen if I want to be able to key into that one instrument or that or that section of the orchestra or that you know that particular part of the uh, um, you know that particular band member. I can still pick up those things, you know. I think you know having a, a clean mix, so that right. you know if I want to key into the bass line of something, I can key into that bass line. If I want to key into the horn section, uh, I can without having to struggle to listen to it. Um, being a, a keyboard player uh, in, in, in popular music, a lot of times keyboards uh, in, in pop music tend to be very, uh, I, I think, kind of hidden. And if I can, and again, they don't need to be, they don't need to be the, the, the prominent thing, but um, I want to be able to hear the keyboard part. You know, I can always hear the guitar part. I can always hear the, the bass line. You can always hear the drums. But the, the additional instruments that are, they're kind of helping you fill in the rest of it, you know, I, I kind of get a bit, well, I can't hear that all until it's like, you know, an obvious part of the song where there, there needs to be keyboard presence or it's the guy's solo, you know, it's like, well, okay, great, thank, I can hear it then, but, you know, where's, where's all the chords that I'm not listening to, you know, it doesn't have to be just a, a piano part, you know, something like a, a Billy Joel or Elton John, where I can, you're obviously going to hear the piano, but if it's, if it's in the background somewhere, you know, I want to be able to hear that, just like I want to be able to, if I'm listening to symphonic pieces, I want to be able to hear those little bits and pieces um, throughout that, so, you know, I can see that, you know, where you're taking the, the sound engineer part of that and putting it with the wine so that if I want to key into one little aspect I can but I also can take a, a step back and, and look at the whole picture. You know I think that's the art in winemaking. You know I, I'm sure when I'll use the Beatles when they set out to create something they, they kinda had a, a vision in their minds of what they wanted it to be and then they worked with George Martin or whomever to get that down and recorded. Uh, same thing for Chad and I. We had a vision of what we wanted and we wanted long finish and we wanted layers and I wanted a top note of caramel on the back and I wanted fruit but I didn't want syrupy and so that's the art is, is how do we, when do we pick, how do we grow, where do we source the grapes, from what part of the vineyard, from what soil, soils what's the yield, you know, how do we, we crop the canopy, uh, what sort of barrels do we use, uh, how do we blend. Uh, um, we did 12 different blends before we came up with 1% Petit Verdot, 1% Merlot and half percent Cap Franc. So that sounds like minuscule little, little splashes, uh, but it was the best of 12 different options we considered and they were all very much different. Um, you know, and, and in, in my years of, uh, of, of doing this, of, of tasting wines, and, you know, the first few times, you know, the first, my first real experience with kind of delving into it, you know, you see those minuscule amounts of, of percentages, and you're like, really? Does this really matter? But, I mean, it, it can, like, 
the Cabernet Franc now with with pepper tastes. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, and that that's one of the things I I'm, I think I'm a little bit hypersensitive to is that I tend to pick up those maybe a little bit more than other people, but I and but I also love it. Right. You know, so as this wine has been developing for the past, say, you know, 20 some odd minutes that we've been, that we've, well, about 15 minutes has been in glass. Uh, I've had the bottle open for, I opened it around about 45 minutes to an hour before we started. So, I mm -hmm. mean, there's, there's been enough, there's been time for, for air to interact. Um, but just even over the short period of time that we've been tasting the wine, you know, you're seeing it evolve over time. And, you know, that, that, that's a, a, I think a great sign of, of a good wine that's a wine that's well made and well balanced because it's not just the same thing over, you know, I'm not, if I, if I leave this in glass or leave it, uh, leave it open two hours from now, it's not going to taste exactly the same. It's going to evolve and develop and all wines should do that. But some wines are kind of, you know, you know there's some wines <laughs> you open the bottle and it's the best it's going to get. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is not one of them. Um, this is a wine that'll get better for most of an evening. Um, in, in fact, I opened a bottle uh, about six months ago, uh, had a tasting with, with some people, had it open for an hour. We didn't finish it. I set it back, went to dinner that night and brought the rest of the bottle. And after being open for most of the day, uh, it was the most incredible transformation. Um, just absolutely superb, and I've heard that from a lot of a lot of my customers about how this particular vintage uh, really changes with the exposure to air over maybe even six or eight, six or eight hours. Right, I mean that's that's, that's something that's where you know even just in general, um, uh, if you know you're going to have wine tonight and you're working the the Monday through Friday eight to five job. You want to open that bottle of wine before you go to before you go to work. Now, with it being a very limited amount of air exposure, you know, eight hours, ten hours later, you know, it, it's you're going to have it, that that bottle of wine is going to develop. Again, some wines are going to be as good as they're going to be when you first open it. Um, right. You know, you're not going to necessarily do that with your with your uh, uh, more inexpensive wines, but you know, having that benefit of of leaving it open for a while um, and coming back to it. Uh, is is one of those again? I think a wonderful thing about wine. You know, I, and I think the more that's going on, um, the more art that was put in the development of the wine, the more it benefits from that sort of thing. Like you said, when you first tasted, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Right, it needs and, a little and, bit of time to settle out. Right, and there's a lot of stuff, but at the same time, it, it wasn't like a disjointed a lot of stuff. You know. It was, no, no, no. you know, it was like you know, kind of like it's the crescendo of of a symphony it, where every, all the parts are there. They're you know, the conductor is 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 putting them all together in the, just the right spot or you know, in just the right um, levels. And the musicians, they all they all know how loud they need to be playing and how intense, and it, it's all getting there. And then now we're kind of getting into more of. A, Every little section is starting to kind of have its little bit of spotlight. You know, now I'm I'm really smelling the cedar. You know, right. um, I'm getting that cigar box type of thing, pencil shavings. You know, and and it's it's one of those things where it's 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 definitely progressing. You know, it's like it started off with a big orchestra hit, and now it's like okay, now let's start kind of go through the the more elegant part of of the piece, and then we'll uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Right, and again, when you think about grapes from Mount Beater. Grapes from Howell Mountain, some Petit Verdot, some Merlot, some Cab Franc, harvested when each was appropriately ready. The extended maceration, the four different coopers, the 20% of the barrels from Limousin Forest. All those ingredients are all the different instruments that were put together to create the particular sound that we were looking for. So it's it's not a simple wine. It's, right. it's not a um, just grow five tons off an acre and harvest it, ferment it, put it in a barrel for six months, put it in a bottle and sell it. I right. mean, this is a much more complicated hand-made process in order to get a very unique product. Um, and then again, you know, that's the difference between the art and the science. Um, the science has to be there, but it's the art of orchestrating all these different elements to make something that's truly unique. Right. 
um, that in my mind makes it valuable uh, and not generic. Uh, and that's what we tried to do. And I mean, I think, and, and having you go through all that and, and, and talk about all the care and, and uh, uh, work that's put into it, you know, I think that's something where people need to understand because, you know, this is not an inexpensive wine. Um, no, no, no. You know, and, and you know, there's, there's reasons why wines are priced the way they are. It's not just, you know, because somebody wants to, to have either a cheap wine or an expensive wine or a moderate wine. I mean, there's, there's a business side of this, too. Um, you know that the you know, wines are priced a certain way. Um, uh, when I went to your website, these these are retailing for ninety dollars. You know, this is not right. an inexpensive wine. It's a great wine. Um, I think it's a great value too. I mean, for for ninety dollars, you know, it's you know it's it's definitely a wine that I, I wouldn't have a problem paying ninety dollars for. You know, um, well, interesting because <laughs> we you know it's a it's a relatively unknown brand. Uh, but we've done a number of blind tastings against some very, very famous brands and and outscored them virtually every time. Uh, and I've been involved in six or seven of these blind tastings. And people are really surprised when, you know, we take the brown bags off and they go, wow. Right. You know, uh, and, and, you know, again, like I said, it's, it's, it's a, a, you know, a small a small brand. It's a you know somewhat a relatively unknown brand. If I saw this on the shelf, I'd kind of go, okay, you know, ninety dollars. I mean, it, I would be a little hesitant to take the risk on it. You know, right. I would maybe go look at something else that even if even if I'm looking at the Howl Mountain and, and Mount Veter Appalachian, you know, well, I know this one a little bit better than this one, so I'll I'll spend the even seventy dollars or a hundred on that where I may not spend the ninety. So I mean, this is definitely you know a, a, another outlet for people to see that. You know, there's, it's not just, uh, uh, it's something that if you, if you, if you've got the $90 to drop on it, you know, I would definitely recommend it, you know, and you, you're not going to be, you're not going to be disappointed with it. You're not going to sit there and go, man, this wine is not that good. No, it's really good. And like we've been talking, Wait, no. I think it's also a wine that benefits from, from decanting. Um, you know, you, you open that bottle, decant it, uh, let it sit out for a couple hours. You know, you know, you know, you're going to have some dinner tonight. Um, you know, get get it decanted as soon as you walk in the door, um, or you you know maybe you're you know it's the weekend that type of thing. But it's definitely a wine that's going to benefit from from some time because even like I said, the short period of time that we've been drinking it, it's already going through lots of phases, and those those are wines that I really 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 enjoy. So I, I sent a bottle to Robert Parker, who's okay. the, you know, one of the foremost wine critics in the world. The first yeah, he's year. All right. I, I, <laughs> The, the first year I couldn't get him to taste it. The second year I got him to taste it. He gave it a 93 and called it a, a new discovery. Uh, so even guys like Parker, you know, uh, there's a lot of wine out there. But when he finally opened the bottle and tasted it, he went, "Wow, this is yeah, really yeah. good." You know, so. and, and that's that's where you know it's it's great to have that get that recognition. You know, you're uh, you're putting a lot of hard work into it, and like I said, you know, uh, Parker first year, yeah, okay. Second year, he goes, okay, let's let's try it, and you know, lo and behold, it's like, okay, this is something he, that you know. Yeah, he loved it. That's awesome. So, I am I'm definitely going to be uh, popping this in the decanter, which is somewhere back here, somewhere. It's over there in the off off camera. Uh, I'm going to be definitely popping this in the decanter in a little bit and uh, kind of let it sit and then uh, drink a lot of this. We'll gonna finish it off tonight for sure. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> And uh, I can't wait to do that and, and really see how it how it develops over time. Um, like I said, if if uh, you find this out there, or even if even if you don't, even if it's not like something you're going to go out to the to your wine shop, you know, go and click the link down below. Uh, go to the go to the to the winery's website and uh, check it out. Get on the mailing list, and you can order it from there because I, you're not going to be disappointed from it. You know. Um, it's it's definitely a, a, a wine worth worth trying uh, and worth having. Thank you, Mark. This is awesome. I really like it. Thank you. And you know, uh, it doesn't it doesn't hurt that I also like the whole geekiness aspect. But even even if I even if it was a brown bag, you know, if it was a brown bag thing, I would be like going, man, this is pretty darn good wine. You know, um, you know, I, like like many of my followers know, I just came back from from Bordeaux, which of course. They just saw a bunch of the interviews uh, that, that I conducted over there prior to this, 
prior to this episode. Um, you know, so I mean, I went to, I went to a place that you know arguably makes some pretty darn good wine, and I had you know not a wide range of places I went to, but you know all everyone I, everyone I went to you know makes quality wine. Uh, I I wasn't just going to Cru you know uh, to uh, Cru Beaujolais, uh, not Beaujolais, <laughs> Cru Bourgeois uh, wine, and uh, you know I was you know I was you know some of the some of the second, third, fourth growth wines out there in Bordeaux and. You know, I think you know this is something that definitely stacks up against those types of wines. I mean, the the quality I was eat, drinking over there, um, this is a, a wine that, uh, well, it's not a this a Bordeaux wine. I mean, for its quality level, it, it's if it's the type of wine that you like, you're going to not be disappointed. Let's put it that way. Well, it's a new world style as opposed right. to an old world style, so it's 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 fruitier and and bigger than a Bordeaux. So if you like California and the best of Napa and the best of California mountains, you're exactly. gonna like this, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I didn't want anyone. I don't want anyone to think I'm trying to compare it to a Bordeaux, but I'm just want to say that you know, for 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 the California side of things, this is you know, we're up there into those into that quality level that um, you're not gonna be disappointed with it. You know, like I said, it's, this is not this is not you know the five dollar bottle that you bought off the off the grocery store shelf. Um, you know, this is this is definitely you know a, a bottle that's going to be um, uh, worth the money. But you know, you're not you're not it's it's not expensive, but you're going to definitely be very pleased with it. And that, yeah, that's it's, it's among the best of the best that you can get from Napa. And 2007 was among the best years that Napa has ever produced. And this will age for 10 or 15 years um, easily. And, and it's and it's rare. I mean, there were only 300 cases made. Right. Very good. Um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and wrap this up. I just want to really, again, thank you for, uh, for joining me. Um, this was about, what, a three or four month process of uh, trading some emails. Yeah, I think uh, so. I know you had originally uh, sent me an email. I was like, so tell me about this. And I was like, well, you know, I got this little podcast, and this is kind of the, the wines that I, that I focus in on. And then you're like, well, my, my wine's about $90. And I'm, I, I'm looking at the email going, well, it's a little more than I normally do, but you know, it doesn't mean I can't do uh, uh, right. wines that, that are in this price range because I have done that. I mean, heck, the wines that from the Bordeaux that I just did, you know, they're they're definitely they're not ten dollar wines either. No. Um, but uh, you know, there's it's nice to focus on that twenty dollar and under wine, but you know, you, you also want to be able to f showcase you know the the uh, the higher priced wines, you know, and in in what should also be better wines. Um, you can find some, you know, nice drinking twenty dollar wines. Um, sure. But when we start getting into this type of, you know, fifty dollars and above, you know, it's really nice to really get into these wines too, and, and kind of helps educate people to go, you know, what, splurge a little bit, you know, expand your palate to 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 really taste some of these wines. And again, I like to think of it as the artist, as applied to wine, where it's handmade by someone that has an artistic vision. That takes the time, spends the money, um, and has a passion to create art with wine. And and you know it's it's limited, it's quality, it's unique, right? It's it's vision driven as opposed to and there's very good wine that's mass produced, uh, but it's less than twenty dollars because they produce a lot of it in a in a methodical way, and it's not necessarily art driven or particularly unique right um, so this is the other end of the scale this is something that's that's very unique um, there's not another wine out there that tastes like Ariel uh, because there's not another wine that's made like this right um, and that's and you know that's one of those things where you know your your novice uh, wine drinker that just kind of sticks with a, for, you know just like a couple brands I think once they start getting out of that that comfort zone, they start seeing that you know I've been doing that. You know, I see, you know, tasting wines from all over the world, and not really sticking with any one particular wine. You know, I, I see those things. I see those um, differences. Is that you know some wines might taste kind of similar because you know because of how they're made or their price points, but then you also get to those wines that that really kind of have that unique uh, taste to them. And in my mind, those are the wines worth finding because those are the wines that are different. Right. Different's good. <laughs> different is good. <laughs> different is good. Especially good and different. Right. It's the best. Exactly. All right. Well, Frank, we're going to go and wrap this up. Um, I just want to again thank everybody uh, for stopping in and joining. Of course, 
thank you Frank for uh, uh, reaching out to me and sending me the bottle and then uh, finally being able to sit down and, and do this. Um, as always, uh, stop by the website, uh, check everything out on there. Um, every episode, as long as they have a link to a website, you know, there's always links on the website uh, to, to find out more about uh, not just this wine but any other wine out there. Um, and check out you know, the sommelier school. We'll be getting that going a little bit more soon, another month or so. I'm going to start uh, getting, off, getting ready for the next level with the sommelier tests and uh, have big plans for more things on the website. We just got to implement them. But um, again, I want to thank everyone for stopping in. Uh, and we'll see where we begin next time. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.